Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the second meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, as normal, on your mobile phones, can you put them into a process that doesn't interfere with proceedings, please? Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's budget for 2019-20 from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work. Derek Mackay is joined by Scottish Government officials, Aidan Greaswood from the Head of Tax, Tax Division, John Nicholson, who is the Deputy Director of Public Spending. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting, but before we move to questions, Cabinet Secretary from the Committee, um, I invite you to make uh, an opening statement. Oh, I understand uh, the budget uh, is comprehensive, that uh, I've given a, a statement to Parliament. I think I'm keen to get straight to your questions, Convener. Okay, thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, the Scottish Fiscal Commission state in their December forecast report that it's not unreasonable to expect an average one-year-ahead error in their tax forecasts of around £530 million, and that of the 53 UK tax forecasts they have looked at, there was an error of £810 million in a Scottish context on more than 11 occasions. Given that your borrowing powers for forecast error are limited to three hundred million pound. Does that concern you, Convener? I know that we've uh, discussed uh, before the <coughs> complexity of the system and the fiscal framework, and uh, there will be a review of the fiscal framework. Um, of course, I would want the forecast to be as close to, to actual um, as possible. Um, there are provisions, of course, as you've described, uh, Convener, around our borrowing powers and also the availability of reserves. And I've said in terms of a budget that I would want to be able to have adequate reserves uh, should there be any requirements such as that um, forecast error. So, of course, we want it, uh, the, the forecast to be as accurate as possible from the SSC and the OBR in terms of the BGA uh, element as well. Um, so we have a number of levers to deal with that uh, should the SFC forecast turn out uh, not to be accurate, as you have described, uh, borrowing um, uh, uh, reserves and then decisions that might be taken in terms of that particular budget year as well. Um, having said that, of course, um, the, the further we go into this process and this system, uh, the more data we have, uh, the more uh, accuracy I think that the SFC uh, and uh, HMRC has around uh, the detail, the outturn numbers, and of course you get closer to each fiscal event, then we have the most up-to-date reports as well. So of course our finance secretary watches us very closely, of course I'm mindful of it, and that's why we have to have a number of levers to be able to manage that in the event of forecast errors. Okay. To get a better understanding of, of the possible extent of the risk cabinet secretary, I think I would certainly help find it helpful. I think the committee would too, if we could explore just one specific example. The most recent Scottish Fiscal Commission and OBR forecasts show that income tax receipts are now forecast to be £43 million lower in 2018 than the adjustment to the block grant, when previously in December 2017 they were forecast to be £428 million higher. To what extent should that, therefore we be concerned about these revised forecasts? And is there a need for the government and some of the and maybe building on what you've already said to take a strategic approach to dealing with any potential shortfalls rather than waiting for the publication of the final outturn figures in July 2020? And while we're just dealing with that area, how do, where, where do you see the Scotland Reserve in that regard, given where it's currently at? We'll give an update on the Scotland Reserve, of course, at the next appropriate time. It remains uh, fluid, as you'd expect, because we present it um, at, uh, at the medium-term financial strategy, at budget uh, revision we've done so as well. In terms of the strategy for dealing with it, the decision that Parliament makes from year to year on an annual budget is to determine uh, the revenue that it raises and what it wishes to um, uh, spend. 
if there was a request from committee or elsewhere to have a particular strategy to build up reserves to a particular figure, that, that would be a budget decision, essentially. And if that's to put more aside in reserves, and some members have, have mentioned that in the chamber as recently as the, uh, the last couple of weeks, if that was a deliberate policy choice, of course that is a choice, but to put more into reserves would take it away from day-to-day -day spending, and, that, and that's a political choice. What I'm trying to do through this budget is give both stability, its stimulus and sustainability for our public services. So, of course, because of the issue that you're flagging up around uh, uh, risk in terms of forecast uh, error, uh, not, of course, from Scottish Government, but the processes we are bound by in terms of SSC, uh, OBR, uh, uh, and the material impact that, that that has in terms of the resources that we have available. Uh, but if there was to be a strategy to, for example, set aside further uh, amounts for the reserve and take it from day-to-day -day spending, that, that very well could be a strategy, but it will affect the, the budget as proposed. And I just think that members should be very mindful uh, of that. I have set out my uh, ambition to try and ensure that we have uh, an adequate amount uh, of uh, uh, reserves. Of course, there's repeated calls on me from all sides of the chamber to use any reserves uh, that we do have. Um, but I think it would, of course, be appropriate to try and have reserves uh, to account for some of the forecast error if that transpires. But there are other levers, as I've described as well, uh, and also uh, the decisions that we would take from year to year uh, in uh, the budget. Uh, and really importantly, it is advisable that those agencies advising us give us the best forecast possible uh, so that there isn't that level of reconciliation that might concern us all. Thank you. Um, in that case, Alex. Thank you, Convener. I'm very much in the same vein. Um, we, we've heard in previous uh, sessions that by the time we get to 21, 22, you know, whoever's Scottish Finance Minister then uh, will be starting with a negative reconciliation of 472 million. Uh, and with your proposal to draw down 85 million from the capital reserve and 250 million from the resource reserve, uh, you'll have, you'll have max, uh, drawn down the maximum allowed under the fiscal framework. Yeah, so, a simple question here is will you be writing a letter for your successor that there's no money left? Uh, and if that is. <laughs> Uh, and if it is the case, yeah, is it true to say your legacy will be to have single-handedly bankrupted Scotland? Absolutely not, and that's absolute total nonsense. Very colourful language for this morning. As I say, I know there's been dramatic events in Westminster and trying to, to emulate it. Here's a nice try, Mr Burnett, but I'm afraid not. Um, the reality is, of course, as we get closer to each uh, fiscal event, we have the most up-to-date advice. And I'm sure that all members are very familiar with this. We've had these debates. The, the forecast will inevitably change. The numbers will inevitably uh, change. Uh, the most recent information from the SFC has actually upgraded their uh, outlook in terms of economic growth. That's the most recent um, report that SFC uh, have published. And that's progress from the medium-term financial strategy that was published uh, last year. Uh, the Scottish Government has produced uh, balanced budgets. It uh, will continue to do so. Uh, there, is, there is that flexibility I've described in the arrangements. Uh, as we've previously discussed at committee, of course, uh, is there room for further discussion with UK Government, say, around the borrowing limits and the caps? Uh, yes, I think there should be, because in light of some of the constraints that we face, um, it is right to have more uh, fiscal and financial flexibility, taking into account some of the issues uh, that have been uh, raised. Uh, and in terms of the point of spending uh, money, we all produced uh, and have produced consistently uh, balanced budgets. If I was to follow the advice of the Conservatives, we would have less uh, income tax to spend on our public services, and that's uh, the reality. <coughs> Again, I didn't hear anyone. I didn't hear anyone say at any fiscal uh, event uh, before, in terms of the budget last year, uh, say that the SFC um, uh, projections around income tax that uh, led to the budget decision should all be banked in reserves. The request I got from Parliament was to spend. Um, uh, the, the budget. So, balanced budgets, competent budgets, <coughs> stability, but the financial arrangements that we have set out in the fiscal framework is what we're following, and there's provision as to how you deal with that in the event of forecast error. And as I say again, this isn't the government's forecast, this is the SFC's forecast, which I know you're very comprehens uh, comprehensively probed uh, and challenged, uh, convener. But the uh, catastrophic uh, circumstance that Mr Burnett has allowed will not come to pass. 
uh, you know, colourful language or not, you, you did say on Wednesday that other levers are available to the government in the event of a negative reconciliation. Uh, so can I ask you, what, which levers are you looking at? Uh, and if not, why not? Well, I think I've this morning already gone through some of those levers in terms of the borrowing capacity <coughs> that we have in the event of the forecast error, uh, the use uh, of reserves, and then decisions that... Uh, government can take or a finance secretary can take in proposing to parliament uh, the budget in that year. I've also set out it would be my uh, desire uh, to try and ensure that we have reserves as well. But if parliament wants to take a choice to take more out of day-to-day -day spending, to put it into reserves, uh, that's a choice that the parliament should take, but just like the same as the alternative to the budget overall. If parties wish me to do that, to take it out of the NHS or local government or education or anything else, to put it into reserves at this time, that's a legitimate line of inquiry uh, to put as an alternative. But it's, it's not the position that's been put by other parties in the Scottish Parliament. It is to stimulate the economy, provide stability, uh, the sustainability of our public services and present that balanced budget. Uh, but we are all familiar with the issues of forecast error if the SFC have got any of uh, the numbers uh, wrong in terms of what they forecast. And they are, of course, just economists looking to the future and trying to establish what they think the tax takes uh, uh, will be in the future. But I would want to reflect again that the most recent report upgraded the economic performance of Scotland. Uh, as subdued as it is, and we know that's because of the pressures that are coming from the uncertainty of Brexit, which have certainly not been resolved uh, as of uh, last night, and some of the demographic challenges that our country faces. So the government is getting about trying to stimulate the economy, address these issues, and we would be able to do more if we had more powers so to do. And again, to go into the complexity of the forecast, there's been revisions because of improved data. Again, something I know that the committee has, has probed with the SFC uh, and HMRC in terms of the tax take that's in Scotland, because increasingly we're moving from forecasts in what UK government agencies think they raise in Scotland to greater detail in what they actually raise in Scotland. But of course, that is the premise. That's the, 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 you know, the numbers that we have to wrestle with in determining uh, uh, the budget. But I've tried to set out the, the balanced decision that I've taken in, in presenting a, a budget to Parliament uh, that is very mindful of the, the need for, for today and this year and for the public services going forward. Thank you, Convener. James Kelly. <coughs> Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. The spice blog on the taxation impacts of your uh, budget demonstrates that anyone uh, earning uh, less than 124,375 would be paying less tax as a result of this budget. Do you think that's a fair taxation policy? Well, I think what we've, we've done around uh, Taxation overall has met our test around uh, income tax. That's around having a more progressive system uh, with the recalibration uh, last year. It's stimulating, supporting the uh, economy, supporting uh, lower earners and raising more income. That was the four tests that we set out on the role of income tax in Scotland's budget. Um, of course, there are changes to the personal uh, allowance. Um, I do think the tax policy that I've put across is fair uh, and progressive. It's true to say uh, that I've not increased the tax rates, so that's percentage tax rates. But what we are not doing is passing on the tax cut in terms of the higher rate threshold uh, to the, uh, that element of, of higher earners um, in Scotland. But the decisions I've taken, I think, are a balanced one, are fair and are progressive. But it is true to say um, that... Uh, because of the, the personal allowance that, and I'm not increasing the tax rates, uh, that a number of people will be paying the same or less <coughs> tax. So those that have tried to describe it as a huge um, a tax hike um, would, would not be uh, accurate. So you think it's entirely reasonable that Cabinet Secretaries like yourself, who are scheduled to earn 111000 in the next tax year, would be paying less tax? Well, I, I would want to uh, point out that Cabinet Secretaries such as myself have taken a voluntary pay freeze since 2008. Um, I've not been a Cabinet Secretary that long, of course, uh, but um, that is the position for Cabinet Secretaries since I've been asked about my own um, uh, position. Um, yes, I do believe that the income tax proposals that have put forward are fair because they meet those tests of raising uh, necessary income, 
protecting the economy, and that's an important balance right now to give that stability, to uh, protect lower income earners, because that's the system that we've designed um, and in terms of being more progressive. We're not <coughs> passing on uh, the tax cuts uh, for higher rate uh, taxpayers that the UK government is doing in terms of uh, raising the, the threshold there. So I do believe that the, the rates and bands that we've put across are fair, are progressive, and they're the right balance at this point uh, for Scotland. So you think it's fair that government ministers, managing directors, chief executives on salaries of around £100,000 are paying less tax as a result of your budget? As a result of the budget, it meets the principles that I have set out, which raises more money, uh, which is more progressive, uh, which protects lower income earners, and is, as I say, far more progressive. It's not passing on the uh, cuts from the UK government in terms of the higher rate threshold. And I think it's very interesting that James Kelly is asking the question when the Shadow Chancellor in the UK Parliament has said uh, that he will emulate Tory policy. He won't undo uh, the Tory tax cuts in the UK Parliament in relation to income tax, but that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm not passing on the Tory tax cuts in Scotland. It raises more money, it protects lower income earners, it's a more progressive system, uh, and it's fair. <coughs> what I've also done is look at the evidence. And I've looked at the uh, evidence in terms of impacts that might come to pass if you, for example, as Labour has proposed, increase the top rate uh, of tax uh, to a point where you actually raise less revenue. Now, that would be counterproductive to our public services because that lost revenue would simply mean we had less to spend in our public services. Uh, so I do think that the approach I've set out is balanced is fair, eh, and in not passing on the Tory tax cut is right in terms of the eh, circumstances for Scotland in trying to eh, deliver the, the society we seek. If you looked at the evidence, eh, have you taken account of the fact that in terms of public services, we hear week after week in the parliamentary chamber eh, the crisis in public services and you know councils are facing the prospect of job losses and cuts in services. Why then have you set a taxation policy where 99 per cent of taxpayers will pay less tax in the coming year? Because I've tried to set out the composition and the structure of the tax base in Scotland and following the evidence I've met the tests that have been set out in relation to the role of income tax in Scotland. I'm wondering why it is the, the Labour Party is just photocopying the Chancellor's tax cuts in, in Westminster and in Scotland I'm told there'll be no alternative proposals from Mr Kelly or any of the Labour Party in Scotland. So if it's not my income tax proposals, what are the Labour Party's proposals in that regard? I think it is absolutely defensible, I think it's absolutely fair and for the tax that is paid in Scotland you get a better deal. It is true to say that for a majority of people uh, in Scotland it is the lowest tax part of the UK and it's the fairest tax part of the UK because the beneficiaries eh, of our policy eh, will include eh, lower earners. So a fairer tax system, a more progressive tax system, and I think one that is based on the evidence that's eh, before us in terms of what optimises eh, our income rather than puts income at risk, which is what uh, the Labour Party have uh, proposed. And there is divergence from UK tax policy, eh, but I think it's a <coughs> divergence that, that reflects what we wish to see as a country in terms of the social contract, the entitlement, but also the economic growth and stimulation for our economy as well. Of course there are challenges because of ongoing austerity eh, from uh, the UK government. I've covered the, the numbers in terms of the overall eh, settlement to Scotland, that if we take aside the health consequentials, then it's a real terms reduction in, in resource to uh, the Scottish budget, and that has put pressure on our public services. But we've taken a balanced decision around tax, and specifically in relation to local government, I'm proposing a real terms increase in resource and capital for local government as part of this budget. This is an area that quite a few people want to c contribute in, and I think we'll probably hear the opposite side of the argument now. Adam? Ah, yes, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, Cabinet Secretary, good morning. Um, um, uh, do you agree that um, uh, the highest 1% of income tax, uh, of earners in the United Kingdom con currently contribute over a quarter of income tax receipts, both to the Scottish Government and to the UK Government? By I would need to go through all the individual figures, but by nature of the composition of the tax base, they pay more. Right. So in, so in terms of 
um, your uh, ambitions to grow the Scottish economy and in terms of your ambitions as Cabinet Secretary for Finance to have uh, more money to spend or indeed to invest in the Scotland Reserve or uh, to, to save uh, um, elsewhere, um, you accept the imperative need in the Scottish economy to attract a greater number of additional rate taxpayers into the Scottish economy. Well, I, I think I've referenced in the Economy Committee, I value people irrespective of what their tax band is. We value people on a range um, of issues, and it's not necessarily just your tax band by which you will be judged. I've said we want to attract people to live, work and invest in Scotland uh, for a whole host of reasons. We, we need that population growth. We obviously want to stimulate the economy and we want tax support as well. So, I, again, I've not set a target just to attract top-rate taxpayers, but of course we want to attract as many people to live, work and invest in Scotland uh, as possible. And as I've said at the Economy Committee, I value the nurse, uh, the carer, uh, the refuse worker and, and, and everyone else. It's not necessarily just top-rate taxpayers, uh, but of course everyone contributes to society. In, in, indeed, I mean, I, I'm sure we would, all, we would all agree with that. But the fact is that for every 20 additional tax rate uh, payers that we attract to Scotland, the Scottish Government accrues an additional £1 million annually in tax receipts. So for 20 additional rate taxpayers, we get a million pounds extra to spend or to save. So my question is, what is the Scottish Government doing to attract new additional rate taxpayers into the Scottish economy? I'm trying to express, as I've done at another committee, we need a whole host of people to no, I, support I, I, I understand uh, that, but I'm asking, you I'm asking you specifically, given the, given the uh, uh, immense contribution financially that additional rate taxpayers make, I'm asking you specifically to identify um, the policies that the Scottish Government is pursuing to attract additional to attra attract a a additional numbers of additional rate taxpayers okay, just, into the Scottish I'm, I'm economy. I'm just, uh, just slightly interested in why the need for nurses or carers or other professions aren't important as well. They, they are. But I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that they are not important. Well, but that's I'm asking, exactly but I'm, what you're saying I'm by asking, asking I'm not me saying to target one Cabinet Secretary, band respect, I'm not, tax I'm, not, Cabinet Secretary, I'm not saying that anybody is unimportant, right? But I, I, but I am identifying. But some are more important am, than others. But I am. Well, some pay more tax than others. But I am identifying that additional rate taxpayers contribute. Um, a, a twenty additional rate taxpayers would contribute an additional million pounds annually for the Scottish government to spend. That wouldn't. That, that money under the under the fiscal framework. That money doesn't go south uh, to Westminster. It stays in Scotland. So I'm asking you to identify. Notwithstanding the importance of other people in the economy and other people in society, I'm asking you to identify what the Scottish Government is doing specifically to attract additional numbers of additional rate income taxpayers into the Scottish economy. Uh, convener, I've, I question the premise of the question. I'll come back to it, simply because I say the Scotland's economy needs a variety of different people yeah, who make a variety of nothing. different contributions no, to our society. But to be asked what we're doing to specifically target a specific band of taxpayer, I think the premise of the question um, it is somewhat strange when we know that the economy needs a, a range of people. We want to attract as many people as possible to come, live, work and investment. And, and, and in terms of what are we doing uh, to try and achieve that, well, first of all, we want a more welcoming uh, migration policy. Uh, we want to build a quality of life that attracts people. We want quality jobs so there's meaningful employment. We want to grow the sectors of the economy that ensures there are those high value jobs and we're doing that through our economic strategy. An education system that attracts people here because of the quality of education or the quality of life is important as well. That can be the environment, that can be the nature of our public services. The social contract, as I say, the prospects to live in a fairer uh, and more socially just society. That should be attractive to all taxpayers uh, as well as just those that Mr Tompkins uh, wants to pursue. It's the kind of society that we seek is more progressive, that's fairer, and of course we want to raise the necessary revenue as well. So it's that quality of life that I think uh, is really important. Uh, and crucially in the SFC's work, when they look at our tax propositions, uh, they look at behavioural effects, they look at behavioural issues and make sure that that is factored in, that the numbers that they give me. And what we have to be very mindful of in our tax policy, of course, is that we're not deterring people to come and live and work and invest in Scotland. And that's why we take the evidence-based approach to ensure that we're optimising the revenue we can raise, attract people to come live, work, invest in Scotland, and ensure we're also protecting our public services and so to do. So uh, I think we're building a better country and that's itself uh, attracting people to come and live and invest in Scotland. Of course the UK government is a far more hostile hostile way attitude to migration. Of course, of course it's interesting when you look at the SFC figures, the Scottish government do actually even though they do nothing at all, the numbers of additional rate taxpayers just 
in terms of the forecasts done by SFC, say they're going to go up in 1920 from 15,800 to 2022-23 to 20,100. Um, despite, you know, without the government having to do anything, the numbers will increase. Uh, it, I just put that on the record as a as a fact from the SFC's own for and that's not a fact because a forecast. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get that right, <laughs> Patrick? Uh, thank you very much, convener. Good morning. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times, cabinet secretary, that one of your objectives on tax policy is to raise more revenue. Uh, this has been discussed in the Chamber a couple of times, but I wonder if you could just say for the record, uh, what is the Scottish <coughs> Government's assessment of the amount of additional revenue that is in the budget for 1920 compared with a scenario of following UK tax policy? So, in, in terms of a divergence between our policy as proposed and if I had followed UK policy, about £500 million. Pounds. Thank you. And given that, that but that's specifically just an income tax, to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and given that that income tax policy was not, in fact, your own party's uh, manifesto commitment, uh, but was the result of, of discussions after the election, I think very positive cross-party discussions, uh, and given that you would have said at the time that your own party's spending commitments were uh, fully costed and funded, uh, and that you've, you've spent what you describe as, as health consequentials, Barnet consequentials, which you're free to decide where to spend, you spent those on health. Uh, this £500 million presumably shows up uh, in some substantial increases in other uh, spending areas. Where is it? Well, I've published the budget year to year. It's in the budgets as proposed. Um, in terms of the £500 million, to be clear, again on the premise of the question, there is divergence, and there was divergence, in the, the income tax manifesto proposition from the SNP in government mm. and from the Conservatives. So there was divergence in tax policy. And some of this uh, is now driven, of course, by the fact that um, the UK government has chosen to implement their higher rate thrash, a threshold um, uh, earlier. So some of the divergence is coming out because of decisions uh, of UK government and of course that has a material impact on us. In terms of the extra resources that's um, generated by the divergence in tax policy, the tax policies that will set out, it's invested in the budget. So last year's in 1819 was invested in the public services uh, of Scotland and the decisions uh, we'll take this year, if we were to take a contrary decision, follow the uh, Conservative Party's income tax policy, what we would have to do is to take £500 million out of proposed spending if we were to follow that policy. So where is the money from the tax divergence? It's in the budget as proposed. I, I, appreciate, the, as I appreciate the, the answer at the extremely general level uh, that you've given. I'm, I'm really hoping for a specific answer. You're saying that there is additional money uh, in the budget for the coming year because part of your objective, part of your intention uh, in income tax policy was to raise more revenue for public services. I'm asking for you to identify specific budgets which have benefited on that kind of order of magnitude uh, from the additional resources that are available. Because, as you know, uh, you're being told by, for example, council leaders all over the country that they're having to strip services down to the absolute bare minimum at the moment. So it's, it's not in there. It's not coming in health because you've already acknowledged that was a, a, a pre-committed SNP policy which would have been funded within the resources you expected to have and the additional Barnet consequentials have, have gone to health from that source. So what are the other areas of expenditure that have seen this substantial uplift? I mean, I mean arguably all the rest of government, you could argue, including local government. So I'll reference what I said earlier, uh, Convener, because this might be helpful, that we don't extrapolate generally out the, you know, just the income tax and say where is that element of revenue being allocated within the budget. You take a total approach of ultimately total revenue and then total spend. It's not hypothecated, I think, in the way that's been suggested. But to give that further detail, um, the, in terms of health consequentials, of course, Scotland was shortchanged to the tune of about £50 million. So the tax changes that we're making, it makes up that figure to ensure that we can allocate to health services so the resources uh, that, that, that were committed. <laughs> Uh, by the UK government in terms of the uplift that they were talking about um, previously. Um, so we, as I've described before, the, 
a UK a resource to Scotland if we discount those health consequentials, for, for the reason I've just given, we've said we'll pass on the health consequentials. For the rest of expenditure, um, that would have been real terms reduction because of that resource allocation. Um, it would have been real terms reduction because, the, um, because of the offsetting uh, of other budgets, essentially, um, from that decision by the UK government. So what the tax policies have allowed us to do, plus the other decisions that I've been able to make, uh, have ensured that other portfolios will enjoy that uh, growth. Local government was a pretty good example. So again, if I had just passed on that real terms reduction uh, of Scotland's uh, uh, budget in terms of resource, fiscal Dell, if I had done that, then local government would have been getting a real terms reduction. But I'm proposing real terms growth for the local government uh, budget uh, in terms of resource uh, and capital. So you don't as I say, extrapolate that element out, but the tax revenues fund the budget as proposed, eh, which the alternative, as I say, quite simply, would have been a £500 million reduction to um, eh, budgets if we hadn't taken the decisions that, that we've taken. So that would have been £50 million less for health services and reduction for um, portfolios as well, to the tune of about half a billion pounds. That's the consequence if we had followed the UK's income tax policy. I know that other members want to come into local government, so I'll perhaps uh, come in in the back of, of that. Yeah, okay, we'll come back to that. There's still a number of areas and a number of people want to contribute in the tax area. So, Angela? Um, just while we're on um, tax, um, the Cabinet Secretary has said a few times in Chamber and in elsewhere that um, as a result of UK imposed austerity, that that has led to uh, a real terms reduction in our total Scottish fiscal budget uh, by 6% or £2 billion um, over the, the decade from 2010 to, to 2020. So I wonder if he can remind us how his decisions overall in tax and borrowing, bear in mind um, as the finance secretary, he's got many competing interests uh, to balance, uh, how he's managed to mitigate uh, the real terms reduction to the Scottish fiscal budget uh, and by how much and what um, additional investment that has enabled in public services. Well, again, looking at those fig uh, figures that we have uh, uh, debated, as I say, over the, the period 2010-11 uh, to 2019-20, Scotland's discretionary resource budget allocation uh, is £2 billion lower in real terms uh, over uh, that uh, period, that's down at 6.9%. Um, I say I've covered the issue of health funding and fiscal resource budget allocation. If we take health funding out in terms of one year to the next for 2018-19 to 2019-20, 20, it's over £340 million lower in real terms than it was in 2018-19. That's 1.3% lower in real terms. So the decisions that we've taken on tax and borrowing <coughs> reduce the real terms reduction to the total Scottish fiscal budget from 6% to 3.8% between 2010-11 and 2019-20. Um, we've generated an additional £712 million for investment in public services. That's £450 million from capital borrowing and £262 million from tax policy uh, decisions. Um, in terms of the budget that we are proposing for this year of interest in 2019-20, the, the difference in terms of the budget we're proposing uh, between 2018-19 and 2019-20 is a difference of £2 billion in terms of the extra expenditure uh, that we're proposing in this budget uh, for our public services. Okay. And the other uh, aspect that I'm really interested in, uh, Convener, is how particular choices in investment uh, can actually increase tax receipts. So, for example, um, we've got record investment in the Affordable Housing Supply Programme of £826 million. Uh, that has to be uh, good news. But I wonder how the Cabinet Secretary could um, talk through um, how that actually improves income tax receipts um, because it works its way through, you know, uh, everybody knows capital investment increases employment and I know that the Scottish Government has done some very specific work around crunching the numbers and what investment in housing means for income tax receipts. 
I mean, specifically, of course, there's employment created <clears throat> through the immediate work, uh, through the um, a construction sector that we want to um, stimulate. That, that applies to a whole host of, of government spending, whether it's on assets or on infrastructure, supporting, stimulating the economy. Um, and that, uh, that investment of £826 million pounds in housing, of course, helps us meet that housing target of providing more homes as well. That's an economic stimulus, short, medium uh, and long term. But it's the employment that's created. And, of course, we've got more people in meaningful uh, employment, paying tax, then we, then we generate more income taxes consequence and in investing the economy there's that circular a, a benefit of the supply chain as well housing is one, one good example but there's a range of commitments to stimulate the economy the, around manufacturing, around a competitive rates regime as well to try and support a business growth and stimulation at this time too but specifically on housing it's a good example of infrastructure investment as the multiplier it affects short, medium and long term and then of course providing more quality houses for people to live in as a good social outcome as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, but can you share the detail of the, 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 the number specific on the, the multiplier effect and what investment in housing means in terms of increasing uh, tax receipts? Okay, well, we can, I can write back to committee in terms of the specific multiplier detail in terms of economic benefits that come from okay. housing specifically. Sure. Okay, thanks. Neil, you had questions in the growth area as well. So. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. In, in the first sentence of your uh, draft budget statement, you said the Scottish budget prepares our economy for the opportunities of the future, and it's very important that it, it, it does. Um, you recently hailed a growth in Scottish GDP. However, this is not forecast to be sustained. Uh, the SFC said we do not accept the stronger growth to be sustained beyond 2019, um, averaging just over 1% over the next five years. And you said earlier that numbers will change and forecasts will change. Um, I accept that, but it's not it's not particularly reassuring. Um, can, what evidence can you present as, if any, uh, that we can have confidence that Scottish growth will uh, growth figures will be higher than the rest of the UK over the next few years? Well. They have been higher for at least two quarters. We enjoyed higher GDP growth than the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, we've had five consecutive quarters of GDP growth. Um, the, I'm just looking at the press release right now from the Fiscal Commission. The headline is, Improved Outlook for Scotland's Economy, but Long-Term Prospects re Remain Subdued. Mm, so, yeah. as we know, we are already uh, outperforming in terms of the uh, forecast, the previous forecast that the SFC had set out in terms of uh, GDP growth. Um, they did revise up the uh, GDP growth, but the, the reason for the subdued nature for it, as I'm sure Neil Bibby is well aware, is because of Brexit uncertainty and some of the other population challenges that Scotland um, faces. Very specific reasons for that. So we, want to, we want to, of course, grow our economy in a sustainable way. That's why we've got the Economic Action Plan. That's why we're trying to create a competitive tax environment. That's why we're trying to give uh, stability to our country at this time when there's the instability of Brexit and, and UK government uh, handling uh, of, of that. Um, so the forecasts, whilst being subdued, have been surpassed so far. Uh, we, will, we will surpass, it looks as if, the, the, once the, the numbers are reconciled, the GDP forecast for 2018. Uh, and looking forward, of course, we want to try and stimulate that as much as possible. And I think that's why it's important that the, the budget does invest in um, the economy, in infrastructure, in digital, in improved productivity, and in the growth areas that we'll have. There's an export um, strategy to enhance our exports, as well as that uh, pay policy, just, just coming back to the benefits of, of people in employment then paying more tax. So there's a range of measures that we're putting into place to try and support and stimulate the economy, give that stability uh, as well. Um, some of the divergence between GDP in uh, UK and Scotland is down to population. Actually, um, we're, we're much closer on earnings per head, uh, but specifically on, on growth, it's, it's the population challenge that presents us with a with a, a disadvantage compared to the, the rest of the UK. But of course, I think we'll all work together to try and stimulate the economy. But I say again, it's welcome news that we've had five consecutive quarters of growth. And for some of those quarters, we were outperforming the United Kingdom. Um, you said that we need to stimulate the economy. And you said the budget provides an economic uh, stimulus. That's a, an encouraging statement. But the proof of the pudding will be in the eating in the Scottish F Fiscal Commissioner forecasting income tax revenues will be down 183 million because of um, the economic 
uh, forecast. But in terms of this, in terms of the stimulus, can I ask you what is the what is the to, what is the value of the economic stimulus that you are providing in this budget, and um, how will we judge the success of your economic stimulus as provided in this budget in terms of growth, wages, uh, and employment figures? Well, I'd say the totality of the budget is quite significant. It's forty-two point five billion pounds. But that's, that's not. The, but can I just? That's not. A, that's not a stimulus. That's no, I think you'll, additional. I think you'll, st stimulus is additional revenue that you're putting in. So I'm asking you the value of the stimulus you're providing in this budget. You can't just say the whole budget is a stimulus. I think I can say that because I think it's perfectly credible to say that the budget helps provide stability and stimulus. Uh, new measures in the budget include what I'm saying around the competitive tax regime, the growth accelerator, and proposing investment in infrastructure, uh, quite a substantial amount. Uh, we're focusing on the growth areas, uh, export, uh, which I've touched upon, uh, maintaining commitments around uh, education, local services. I know we'll come back to it, but in real terms, uh, increase for resource and capital spend uh, for local government, included, including the uh, town centre fund uh, that I'm proposing. Uh, and in terms of, of spend, actually spending on public services does, I'm surprised the Labour members ask me, spending money on public services does uh, stimulate uh, the economy, you know, paying those salaries. A, a, <coughs> yep. a pay, a pay, no, no, a, it is a matter of fact that the it's no. a matter of fact, right. if anyone who's read the SFC report will know that the increased expenditure stimulates the economy. So I think it's perfectly fair for me I, to say that an uplift of £2 billion in expenditure will stimulate the economy as well as very specific economic interventions um, that I'm proposing. Austerity has been the reduction of spend in the public sector, which I think has subdued uh, the economy. And again, I would expect a, a Labour member to understand that. In the budget, convener, um, I have been asked the question, in the, in the budget it, it proposes over £5 billion of capital uh, uh, investment that stimulates uh, uh, the, the economy and proposing an expansion of early years in childcare as well. Energy efficiency, as I say, more on innovation, the National Manufacturing Institute, support for agriculture. So, as I say, digital staff, a, a whole host of areas in enterprise and skills, but the totality of the budget will help stimulate the economy, that is recognised by the SFC in terms of what they've said generally about public expenditure and the, the positive impact it has in the economy, to be fair. So the, the economic stimulus, the, the additional revenue that this, this provides is £2 billion? Is that, is that what you're the saying? Diff, the is that the, 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 the value of the economic stimulus this budget provides? No, what I was asked what's the quantum of the economic stimulus. I'd say the total budget is an economic stimulus, the £42.5 billion. In terms of the, uh, the difference between the budget in 1819 and the budget as proposed for 1920 is £2 billion. So that's the extra resource that I'm proposing uh, to spend as a consequence of the budget. OK, can we move on? Yep. Um, listen, I think we've covered the taxation area pretty well. Uh, I know, Tom, you wanted to come in on that, but I'm going to go to, on to Murdo and underspend. If you want to come in after Murdo, please feel free, but I think we need to move on a bit. Murdo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we, we've got used to, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, a sort of pattern of activity around the budget, where you publish your draft budget in December and you tell us all that's all the money there is, and then we get to sta the Stage 1 debate, usually at the end of January or February, and miraculously you've discovered a whole lot more money lying around that you didn't know about in, in December and use that to, to lubricate your budget deal, usually with the, the Scottish Green Party. So my question is, is this, how much money have you got hidden away this year that you're going to suddenly produce in a few weeks' time that you haven't told us about yet? Uh, convener, again, it's, it's a morning of colourful language. Um, I, as the First Minister has said, I have um, fully allocated uh, the uh, resources at our uh, disposal. Uh, I've set that out in the budget, how the, the, the budget is funded. It, what I have said, though, and is that my door is open as a minority government. We, of course, want to get the budget passed. I think it's really important for the stability uh, of our country, uh, for the sustainability of our public services that uh, the budget is passed. Uh, therefore, my door is open to other opposition parties to come with me with alternative proposals if they wish to amend this budget. And if that means additional resource in one area, they'd have to set out how that would be funded by taking it away from another area or through an alternative tax uh, proposition. So uh, I'm open to engagement uh, on that. Th thank you for that answer. Uh, however, it would 
help uh, opposition parties in that regard if they were fully aware of what additional sums might be lying around you haven't told us about. And, you know, for example, last year, I was just checking the official report uh, from, from the committee uh, for, for last year, in the period from the 15th of January, uh, la this year, 15th of January, uh, sorry, last year, 2018, 15th of January 2018, until the 31st of January 2018, 12 working days, you came up with an extra £110 billion in that period, 12 working days. Um, so is it reasonable for us to expect that by the time we get to stage one, which is coming up, I think, in, uh, what, 15 days' time, you'll have found some additional funds? Or are you telling us this is absolutely it? There's not a penny more available that we don't currently know about? I'm describing to committee that I've fully <laughs> allocated uh, the resources. There were very specific circumstances that I know cheered up the whole parliament uh, last year um, that I was able to uh, identify specific um, uh, changes can be Barnet consequentials, can be forecasts at the time, um, or tax changes that, that um, were suggested. But what I'm, I'm genuinely um, answering the question, I've fully allocated the resources at my disposal to present the best budget possible that takes into account the requests and demands and issues of, of importance to uh, the people of Scotland. So. Uh, I've answered this very clearly to Mr Fraser. Well, I'm not sure you've, you've, you've specifically denied there won't be more money available in 15 days' time. But let me ask you specifically well, then about, I, I about think, the question of understanding. I think what I described, again, is I've fully allocated the resources at my disposal. If opposition parties want to bring alternative proposals to me, I'll engage with any constructive, reasonable opposition party. Well, I, of course, any opposition party... Of which would, I would count would, Murdo Fraser, of oh, course. I, I, entirely reasonable, as you know, Cabinet Secretary, but I think all of us would be better informed and better able to do that if we had the uh, totality of the financial picture. Well, let me ask you specifically about the underspend, because uh, in, the, in the previous uh, year, in the budget for the current financial year, uh, of this £110 million that you uh, produced, I believe £70 million of that came from the underspend. So where are we in relation to, to the underspend and what additional uh, underspend might you be able to uh, discover, to allocate to the budget for next year? Yeah, I'd put it in. I mean, it's, it's factored in in terms of the budget as published. So there's, there's nothing extra going to be produced over the next two weeks? Again, convener, I'm being perfectly clear that I've fully allocated the resources in the budget and I've set that out. And in terms of budget process, there have been uh, changes requested through the um, a budget process review group that have been taken into account. And I've set out at the outset of the budget how the budget um, is funded, and that includes use of the budget exchange um, reserve that I've set out. OK, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We'll, we'll find out, I dare say, in, in 15 days' time who's right. John. And, and good morning. Um, if, if past this uh, budget would come into effect a week after the UK is scheduled to leave the European Union, can you outline, Cabinet Secretary, what the consequences would be if this budget is not agreed to? If the, the Scottish budget isn't agreed to, I think it would be... It would be fairly. It would be devastating to our public services, the state, sustainability of our um, public services, to the stability as well. I mean, I think with the chaos that's going on in Westminster at the moment, we know Brexit's going to be damaging to the UK economy, to Scotland's eco economy, um, and we're trying to avert that. Um, but if the budget itself isn't passed, uh, the, the very specific arrangements around what you would uh, revert to, um, in terms of the difference, as I've described earlier, the figure between 1819 and 1920 is some £2 billion. Pounds. That's the difference. If budget's not passed, as I say, they're very specific arrangements. But I think it would create a great deal of uncertainty um, you know, in terms of all parts of the public sector. I think it would be quite alarmed if the budget wasn't passed. I say it represents um, growth. It represents growth for the National Health Service. Uh, an increase uh, for local government, for other parts of the public sector as well, investment in the social contract of our, of our country. If, uh, uh, if, if it doesn't pass, that would have profound effects. And I think that's why we have to work so hard to make sure we find the necessary compromise that the budget can be passed so we can release that £42.5 billion spend into our public services and provide uh, the economy with the stimulus that it desperately, I think, requires right now in view of the particularly in view of the Brexit mishandling of the UK government. And it's, you know, it's for, for all of us to find that necessary compromise. 
And just to clarify uh, my understanding, and that I'm sure of many of my constituents as well, there are specific policy commitments, for example, around Frank's law and investment in early years. That would be at risk, am I correct in understanding, if this budget is not passed? Well, of course, if, I mean, some, some elements of policy, of course, are driven by um, statute, but you have to have the necessary resources uh, to pay for them. And the commitments that I've outlined uh, in, in the budget, if we're not raising the necessary revenue, well, they can't be paid for. So I think those parties that have asked us to deliver certain policy commitments and haven't done that, um, I think there's an onus upon them to ensure that it uh, passes. I think um, uh, the extension of, of free personal care is a very good example of that. Um, so I would encourage all members to engage constructively with the budget. I can provide more technical detail to the committee, if it wishes, on um, what were to happen in terms of the budget not passing. But in essence, if a budget wasn't to pass, you would revert to previous year's budget. But that assumes you've got the necessary income to pay for it. So a Scottish rate resolution would have to have been passed as well. The non-domestic rates element would have to have been passed too. So I think with the chaos and calamity that's going on south of the border, we should show that constructive, uh, progressive, pragmatic, positive, engaging approach in the Scottish Parliament to ensure that a budget can, can pass so that we can support our, our vital and public services, give that economic stimulus and that sustainability, as I say, for those public services and deliver a fairer tax system um, as well, but to actually raise the revenue the revenue raising the legislative requirements have to be passed. Thank you. Patrick, was a supplementary to Tom's question? Uh, just very briefly, uh, thank you. Given that uh, Tom Arthur and the Cabinet Secretary have both made the, the connection and the comparison with the, the Brexit process and the, uh, the rather reckless my deal or no deal approach that the, the UK government have taken, uh, would I could I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary to acknowledge that that kind of uh, kind of catastrophic uh, approach uh, is entirely the wrong one, uh, especially in a context in the Scottish Parliament in which, to aid Mardo Fraser's uh, recollection, uh, for example, my party and his party have voted for SNP budgets on precisely the same number of occasions since your party came to power. I, I, I am a far... A, I, I'm a constructive and, and reasonable finance secretary, and I'm setting out that I have found compromise in my previous two years' budgets, and I hope to find a compromise uh, going forward. My door is open to engage with others, and uh, I hope to, to meet with success in so doing. I think it's vital that we do that for, for the reasons that I've given, so I, I will continue to engage uh, uh, constructively to try and find the necessary compromise. I don't think I can be any clearer on that. Also checking the, the record, the SNP uh, uh, for a number of years also voted for executive uh, budgets in opposition. Mm -hmm. So it is actually a responsible thing to do, to vote uh, for the executive and the government's uh, budget, because the alternative that, that Tom Arthur has touched upon it, it would be very damaging to our public services and our economy if the budget were not to pass. But, you know, it's our job to make sure we find that necessary compromise. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Emma, I think you had a question. Or a there. Well, it's, thank you, convener. It was really just to clarify that what, what you said uh, earlier about uh, the Barnet Consequentials and health that... Uh, were or are not now coming to us. Yesterday at Health and Sport Committee, Jean Freeman was asked questions about uh, about the, the, the budget and the issue of the funding gap of the, I think it's £55 million that the NHS isn't getting now. But your um, tax decisions that you've taken as budget will help meet that funding gap. Am I correct? And how, how has that been managed? Can you just clarify that? I think, um, as has been uh, outlined, there is. I mean, I, I do welcome the, the health consequential. I want to say that first of all. I mean, it is, it is welcome that the, there will be health consequential. But the issue is what was committed to Scotland, and what Scotland will receive because of the offsetting elsewhere is less. That figure is correct of 55 million pounds. And I had said that we would reinstate that. There's a total spend to health services that we would uh, reinstate that, and uh, that essentially ensures that. Uh, health resource funding uh, will be increased by £729 uh, million. Pounds. Um, so um, I think that's quite quite a significant increase, and Jean Freeman would have gone through the detail uh, at Health um, Committee. That will take total resource spending on health and sport to £13.9 uh, billion. Pounds. Um, and that also means more support uh, of an area of interest to many members as well, around mental health um, specifically, because 
um, it's been touched upon that there have been many um, requests for, for more expenditure, and that was one, and I think that that's absolutely the right thing to do. So, yes, in our tax decisions, we've reinstated the shortchanging of the £55 million in relation to health um, consequentials. That's, uh, and as I say, I've outlined that as the nature of... Uh, uh, the Barnet consequentials, an increase in health, but been offset by cuts to to elsewhere because of the uh, construct of the UK government's decisions. Okay, and it's just a wee sup to what Tom Arthur brought up about um, Frank's law, for instance, and if the the current budget is approved, there will be a package of investment of £120 million transferred from the health portfolio to local government to help with the integration or, um, of health and social care. So th that's actually a really important contribution to support local government in uh, managing our integration process as well. It, so as well as the, the specific resource around uh, free personal care, that's true. The integration journey is a really important one to ensure that people get the support that they need. Uh, and in the discussions I had with local government, there was a request around more support for social care, and I was able to meet that request. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Willie, you LBTT, I think. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Derek. I just wanted to uh, ask you a question on land and buildings transaction. Tax asked the Fiscal Commission <coughs> last week that why they thought the forecasts for revenue were going up significantly at the same time that growth in sales was maybe slightly behind uh, the UK. Uh, and, and it wasn't entirely attributable to the policy change on ADS. It, it was kind of roughly double the, the amount of revenue we would get through that. What's, what's your take on this, and why are we seeing such good performance in the LBTT over the next few years? I think, well, I would want to take credit for the policy change because the intention is to, to raise revenue from that whilst uh, giving that degree of um, stability as well. Um, the, so the SFC can answer for their own forecasts. I, and, and some of these transaction taxes, of course, they can be volatile based on, on the nature of the market, the, the market composition as well, any, any sensitivities within it. Um, but we, through our policy changes, we, we will raise more revenue. And I think some of the um, fears around the, the, the structure, the more progressive structure of um, LBTT in relation to, um, to residential are, are unfounded in that we have... Um, raise the necessary income. Um, commercial transactions are even more volatile because it's just the nature of what property in the commercial sector happens to be selling at a point in time. So whilst recognising the volatility of a uh, forecast and of, of the market sensitivities, uh, the, the policy changes that I'm proposing will continue to raise revenue. So um, that's a pretty sound basis on which to continue. The market will be affected, of course, by any shock in the economy that may come from uh, UK macroeconomic policy and uh, um, Brexit. Uh, but these uh, forecasts are, are based... I mean, the, the budget is contingent upon a deal in terms of uh, uh, UK and uh, the European Union. So the reason I say that is their forecasts are, are, are based uh, on, on their economic forward look, recognising the volatility. Uh, but on LBTT, uh, as Mr Coffey has uh, suggested, we will uh, generate more money um, through our tax policy than, than over and above the, the BGA, Block Grant Adjustment. Mm -hmm. And you can see that over there. I think it's a five-year forecast from the Fiscal Commission. It's that very right. positive, I think. Of course, the forecast may change. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, well, Adam on business rates. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Kavina. <clears throat> um, Captain Second, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about business rates, if I, if I may. Um, in your um, budget document, you said this. Our high streets and town centres are facing challenges as retail patterns change and evolve, and it is essential that we support them to become more sustainable, page 17. So I wonder what your reaction is to the um, Scottish Retail Consortium's um, take on your um, draft budget, which, in which they've said this, that the large business rate supplement remains twice that which applies in England. And business, businesses in Scotland uh, pay a total of um, £65 million extra each year in comparison with what they would pay in uh, at the rest of the UK. And that this higher rate, in their words, simply makes it more expensive to operate on our high streets and retail destinations and raises the hurdle for attracting commercial investment. What's your response to that? Well, that um, 
Mr. Tompkins is only looking at the large business supplement, not uh, business rates or non-domestic rates in their totality, because actually uh, the approach overall, I think, has been welcomed by business representative organisations as being uh, very welcome in terms of, of business, and, and I think for town centres um, uh, as well. I mean, decisions have taken uh, more widely, and of course there is the Barclay recommendation to reduce um, the large business supplement. I said I'll do that when resources. Um, allow. But we are uh, confirming the decision around the, the, the poundage uplift uh, down from RPI to CPI. Actually, we're going uh, below that to make sure that for the vast majority of businesses, all of medium and medium sized uh, businesses in Scotland, that they're paying less tax than they would if they were uh, south of the border. It's actually a slightly under inflation increase in non domestic rates, and that has been welcomed, I say, by the uh, 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 <coughs> business representative. Um, organisations. We're continuing with the, the small business bonus. I'm proposing a town centre fund, and as I say, there's city deals uh, as well, which will support that economic growth. So I think if you look at uh, business rates, non-domestic rates, and their totality, it will show support. I think for businesses, including in retail, uh, we're, we're continuing the transitional relief as well uh, that I've proposed. So that cap for. Uh, 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 North East in terms of offices, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, for hospitality uh, over the piece, recognising the very particular challenges that they face as well. We have lifted 100,000 properties out of rates um, altogether, and as I say, the poundage uplift is, 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 re is less than the rest of, of the United Kingdom. So I think all in all, that is a very supportive package for businesses and takes a relief package to about £750 million, pounds, so three quarters of a billion pounds. And that's an increase in the relief. So, looking, what? I think just looking specifically at large business a supplement discounts everything else we're doing through non-domestic rates <laughs> to support the economy and, and particularly those local economies. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you said that you um, hope to be able to implement the Barclay Review recommendation that the this Scotland-only surcharge of the large business supplement is um, eliminated when resources allow. But the Barclay Review, as I recall, had a specific timeline. Uh, set out in its recommendations. What, what, what's your timeline? What's your forecast of when resources will allow you to take this necessary step? Well, I'm not proposing to do it in this budget because I don't think resources allow me to do it in this bu budget. But I think the other decisions that I've taken will absolutely help stimulate support the economy, provide a lifeline to our town centres, to businesses right across the land. As I say, it's, it's significant that um, uh, uh, Mr Tompkins has quoted the SRC um, and I said you should look at the totality of their comments. It's very much in the Christmas spirit that um, SRC said, with Scottish retailers feeling the pinch after a difficult year, we're glad the Finance Secretary has more of, been more of a Christmas elf than Scrooge in this year's budget. His language, not mine. I might not have worded it exactly the same way. Um, he goes on to say he moves to protect ordinary workers from income tax rises and investment in infrastructure, housing and skills are positive, which should support um, the economy. Well, I'm happy to it, say I missed that particular fancy dress party, but can I ask Cabinet Secretary... Well, these are the quotes you should can, also maybe have can, looked at, as well as can, those that you but, have specifically Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary about, the, the, about, the, about the operation of business rates, particularly in the hospitality section, the sector? And this is an issue that has um, been uh, brought to my attention across Glasgow, the region I represent um, recently. And as I understand it, in the hospitality sector, um, business rates are assessed um, um, by reference to a formula which focuses on turnover as opposed to profitability or floor space or number of employees or any other number of factors that are used in other sectors. And this has led to what can only be described as eye-watering um, uh, and punitive uh, increases in business rates applied in the hospitality sector across Glasgow. So, for example, in a uh, local and much-loved restaurant just around the corner from where I now live in the south side of Glasgow, the owner is faced with a 411% increase in uh, business rates. Um, is this something that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of? Is it something that he's, that, that he, that he's looked at? Is this a, the, 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 the formula for, um, for assessing business rates in the, con in the context of hospitality? Is it something that might be looked at in the forthcoming bill, if it is still forthcoming, uh, on uh, business rates that I think we were promised in the most recent programme for government? Or is it something that we need to take uh, uh, forward separately? So, Mr. Tompkins has um, asked, I'm aware of it. I've reported this to Parliament a, a number of times the issues around uh, non domestic rates, the very specific issue around hospitality. And I've uh, acknowledged that 
uh, in my but in my rates decisions that uh, proposed a cap of 12.5 per cent so that we capped the increase that uh, hospitality uh, would would um, uh, endure from year to year I, I've proposed that and I have uh, committed to that but I think what all members should be very mindful of are the decisions of the assessors around the methodology and how they assess value is actually for assessors, not for government. The Scottish Government ministers do not direct the assessors on the, the methodology. And I need to be very clear about that. Uh, that is a matter for them and they are answerable to the courts ultimately about this. I do agree, however, that they should look uh, in terms of engagement with the sector. I've encouraged them to do this, engage with the sector around the methodology that they um, uh, use. Uh, and I think they are working through the uh, various fora that, that they have to engage with hospitality. But the decisions that I have taken uh, capped the increases within state aid uh, for individual businesses at 12.5% on hospitality. And of course, it's for uh, local authorities to make sure that that's implemented because they collect the non-domestic rates. But again, I, I need to be really clear with committee, it isn't for ministers to direct assessors as to how they change their methodology. That, that is the assessor's independent function. But I think they are engaging with the sector around that. There are different choices. It's not turnover. It's not profitability. There are other factors that arguably should be taken into account. So I am aware of the issue. Um, it is something, as I say, that I cannot direct assessors. But the, where I have the decision-making power, I have capped the increases for hospitality since it's been raised specifically. That's for the whole country. It has to be within state aid limits, which means there's a, an amount of relief um, uh, that, that, that can be attained and it, it does reach um, a limit. But, but I have implemented this transitional relief, committed to it, and then for everyone who's paying on domestic rates, lowered the poundage to a below inflation increase and lowered it from RPI to CPI. That's significant, significant uh, because it means that for every small and medium size a property in Scotland. They're not getting any other relief. They're paying less than they would if they were south of the border. So everyone, not just hospitality, benefits from that. As to is there room for amendment in non-domestic rates bill, uh, let's discuss that when we get to the non-domestic rates bill, where I'm sure members will have a great deal of, of interest in it. But I, I think we need to be very careful not to um, jeopardise the independence of the assessors in making their decisions. But I'd encourage um, uh, Mr Tompkins to, of course, engage with the assessors around the issue that's been raised with them. But I know that I've, I've um, encouraged the, the sector to do that as well. So there are ongoing discussions between the hospitality sector and assessors. But I can't leave anyone with the impression it's a ministerial decision. That's very helpful. Thank you. OK. Um, Neil, I think you want to raise issue about local government issues. Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. Last year you said local councillors were getting a fair settlement, but Cosler and others disagreed and you ended up giving them some more money. Um, this year, local authorities are again clear you're cutting their core budgets by £237 million. Are they getting a fair settlement this year? Well, well I believe that they are. Um, again, I've, I've described that um, the Chancellor had the opportunity to end austerity. He hasn't taken that opportunity. Um, if I had simply copied the, the Chancellor's cuts to the rest of the public sector in Scotland, it would have been a real terms reduction. That's not what I'm proposing for local government. I'm propose, uh, proposing a total core. Um, funding package for local government amounting to £11.1 um, billion, pounds, so that 2019-20 local government finance settlement increases local government day-to-day -day spending for local services by £197.5 £197 million pounds in cash terms and delivers an increase in capital spending of £207.6 million. Pounds. So that is a real terms increase in both revenue and capital settlements for the year that's proposed. Uh, a real terms of increase of over £210 million in the overall settlement. Of course, local authorities can also use their council tax powers as well, something a function that not every other portfolio has, but local government can raise council tax. If they do it up to 3%, that would generate a further £80 million. I've gone over this in great detail uh, with uh, local government committee. I'm happy to do so, of course, convener here again, but I have gone over this in great detail with the local, uh, local government uh, committee. But these are the figures that I've set out to Parliament. You've, you've said before and said it again this morning that if you exclude Barnet consequentials for health that the Scottish Government budget is being cut in real terms. Uh, councils are saying if you exclude uh, money for additional childcare and social care responsibilities, their budgets are substantially cut in real terms elsewhere. But you've turned around to councils and said childcare and social care 
additional funding is uh, for core services, and they need to see it in the round. Do you not see the contradiction in your position? But see, I happen to believe that early learning and childcare and health and social care integration is core to the local government function. It's the debate that I had at local government committee. I mean, I, I've made that clear. I don't see that as separate to local government. I see it as part um, of uh, local government. But, but you're complaining about the UK government um, budget allocations, you know, excluding Barnet consequentials for health. It appears to be one rule for you and one rule for, for councils. And with respect, I don't think you're the sole arbiter of what core services are. Um, can, I, can I also ask you, Sc Scotland's councils are facing increasing pressures, as we know. There's, of course, the outstanding issue of teachers' pay, which is set to be a significant cost, which, if not fully funded, will result in even more council cuts. Will you therefore fully fund the eventual pay settlement for teachers? Again, there's live negotiations, the tripartite arrangements for the teachers' pay issues between Scottish Government, uh, local government through COSLA and the teaching trade unions. Uh, I think there is live discussions. It would be inappropriate for me uh, to, to, to set out any detail on something that hasn't been agreed yet, but I hope that there is agreement. I hope we find that consensus with local government and the teachers' representative uh, trade unions. Uh, and then, of course, we'll look at the, the funding of that. The Scottish Government is trying to be as constructive and helpful as possible, as am I, as Finance Secretary. But it's hard to outline the funding package when agreement hasn't been reached yet, but I hope we do reach agreement. I think a couple of supplementaries, Willie and Patrick. Hey, thanks, Bruce. Just on the local government issue, I mean, um, two of COSLA's spokespersons last week, I think the local government committee described councils in England and Wales as, as collapsing, and thank God there's a different approach being taken in Scotland. Um, Cabinet Secretary, your budget proposals on page 86 of your document shows quite clearly an increase in local government finance from £10.6 last year to 11 point, nearly 11.1 this year. That, that, in anybody's terms, that's an increase, surely. So I, I don't understand why members would continue to claim that's a cut. Uh, well, I have uh, convened set out why uh, it is an increase. It is real cash. So it is real money uh, going to, to local government. As I say, we can, we can debate the priorities within that, um, but it is real money. It is a real terms increase in resource uh, and uh, capital. Um, and I, I would say that for as long as I've been finance director, this is my third uh, budget as proposed to Parliament, which is proposing a, a third year of increase in real terms to local government. And this has been really challenging financial circumstances uh, can be not to go back to Mr Bibby's uh, question if I had simply photocopied the Chancellor's budget it would have been real terms cuts to, to other portfolios all other portfolios including local government I'm not proposing that I'm proposing a real terms increase for local government and in terms of the policy choices and priorities I only can say that when I watched the evidence of the um, uh, COSLA spokesperson for resources uh, she described our priorities as excellent priorities and there is partnership working uh, with local government. So I'm not underestimating the challenge on any part of the public sector because of the UK government's ongoing austerity, but what I'm proposing is actually a real terms increase. Patrick. Thank you. I, I suspect everybody understands actually the, the reason why there are different interpretations being put on these figures. It's not necessary to disagree with the, the new policy commitments that the Scottish Government is telling local government to deliver. It's not necessary to disagree with those policies in order to still be concerned about the core funding uh, of services that are out with those new national commitments that have ring-fenced money attached. Can I share with you uh, some comments that have been sent to me by uh, one council leader uh, saying uh, there is quite simply nowhere else to go. We're now in a position where, like our fellow lo Scottish local authorities, we must seriously consider the unthinkable, stripping services right back to the absolute bare minimum, delivering only statutory duties and cutting absolutely everything else that, while much valued by the people we serve, we are sim simply no longer able to continue to deliver. I've spoken to uh, people both in, in council leaderships and in the trade unions that represent council workers who are telling me about whole council functions that are being in, in danger of being shut down, about budgets like supply teaching, which are in danger of being devastated. You know that that's happening because those councils are speaking to you as well, don't you? 
Convener, I know that, as I've said, I don't underestimate the challenge in any part of the public sector, but what I'm proposing is a real terms increase. It is for any opposition party. If they wish to amend this budget and take more money away from another portfolio and give it to local government to set out what that should be and how that should be done. Uh, and I'd encourage opposition members, if that's what they want to do, bring that to me. But I have tried to give local government the best possible settlement in the circumstances with that ongoing austerity from the UK government, I have tried to ensure that we give local government a fair settlement. And that, in terms of what I'm proposing, is a real terms increase, notwithstanding the fiscal challenge uh, that I've been presented with. In addition to that, local authorities uh, do have the power, of course, to raise council tax as well to supplement their income. And I also say that I've set out the public sector pay policy. And this isn't meant by any way of, of, of criticism, but on, we've mentioned the teaching staff, but on non-teaching staff as well, um, local authorities are offering a, a pay award that they must believe is um, uh, affordable too. So I recognise that there will be financial pressures on local authorities, as there are financial pressures upon Scottish Government, but Parliament has set out a number of commitments uh, that it wishes to see delivered, uh, and that includes free personal care. Uh, and to fund that, to, to ensure that there's a necessary resource to fund that, I think is significant. If members wishes not to do certain things, whether that's free personal care or expand what we're doing around um, education or the Pupil Equity Fund, then they can say so. But we set out our educational, social uh, and other commitments uh, as part of, of, of the budget. There but, it does, but it does represent a real terms uh, increase, and that's what I'm proposing. If other members wish to propose more specifically for local government, they have to set out where that would come from. And, and I hope uh, others will do that, just as uh, I and my colleagues are, are trying to do in, in positive ways. There's a great deal about the UK government's policy, uh, economic philosophy and so on, that I profoundly disagree with. But they at least have the decency, when a tax is devolved, not to say, well, cut your block grant to Scotland if you set tax rates that we disagree with. They don't put your arm up your back and say we're going to constrain you in that way. And you've talked about the extra resources that are available because Scotland is now able to set its own tax policy. Shouldn't local council leaderships also have that ability to make fiscal choices at the local level that are right for their circumstances rather than being constrained in the way that they currently are by your government. At least when Thatcher did rate capping, she had the decency to do it on a statutory basis, not by bullying. Well, I think that um, Patrick Harvey will know fine well that his analysis isn't accurate because the UK government does actually cap council tax increases in England, so the basic premise is, is actually inaccurate because the I UK government I was talking about the UK does... government's relationship to the Scottish government and the ability that we now have to make tax choices that are right for Scotland. I, I, Shouldn't that same respect I, go down the level from Scotland to the local government tier? Well, I understand that at the 2016 Scottish Parliament election, people voted uh, for our council tax proposition, because that's ultimately what we're discussing here. They voted to um, cap council tax at 3%. And that's the position of the Scottish Government. That's not a surprise, and I think it's a great relief to many households that that is a position in these difficult times that council tax is capped. Uh, it's hardly underhand when we put it in a manifesto and we were elected on that basis. Uh, but we're into this area of local government. I suspect that it might draw a few more questions. I've still got some supplementaries to go on this yet. Uh, so I've got Murdo and then Tom and James. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd hear the day Patrick Harvey delivered a compliment to Margaret Thatcher. That's, oh, that's a first for this, 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 it this was, committee, uh, Commissioner. It's damning with things <laughs> anything. Um, I, but I wanted to follow on uh, the questions from, from, from Patrick around lo local government finance and tie it back to a line of questioning from uh, Angela Constance a little bit earlier. D do you accept, Cabinet Secretary, that the Westminster block grant to Scotland in its entirety including resource Dell, capital Dell, and account managed expenditure, is higher today in real terms than it was in 2010? What I've tried to, well, I've tried to specifically draw out the fiscal simple, Dell issue. Simple well, question, yes or no? Well, <laughs> but we do this every year. But I'm very clear in the analysis that I'm using is the fiscal Dell, the day-to-day -day expenditure on resource and our frontline services. And we have this debate every single year. The reason I focus on that is that's what funds education, that's what funds okay. local government, Thank that's you. what right. funds 
um, <laughs> the health service. And I've done it repeatedly because Murdo Fraser knows how significant that is uh, okay. to our budget. OK, thank you, Cameron Secretary. I think we'll take that as a yes, that we know that the overall budget has increased in real terms since 2010. But your argument, which is a reasonable one, is that resource Dell has reduced since 2010, albeit there are arguments about how much has been reduced, and Fraser of Allender would dispute the figures you have quoted to the committee. But do you not it's see very the parallel? of Murdo Fraser to make that compromise for the first do, But do you, not, do you not see the parallel between the, the, the approach I've just outlined in relation to the UK government's overall settlement and the settlement you are giving local government? Because you are arguing, but local government are getting more money in real terms. But Costa will argue that may be the case. But because the additional money is being allocated to particular areas, the amount of money they have for their core spending on resource has been reduced. That is exactly the same argument you are deploying about the block grant from Westminster, is it not? No, it's not. It is. The, <laughs> no, it's not. Because the, the, fis the fiscal resource at local government, and that, that's what partly the discussion is about, the fiscal resource, the available discretionary fiscal resource that's available for local government, that's you know, it's what they're pursuing, that's what they're interested in, is exactly what I'm describing, that the Conservative government have reduced over the 10-year period and excluding the health consequences into the next financial year as well. So, no, it's not the same argument whatsoever. <laughs> it, but I am delighted for the first time that Murdo Freda, Fraser has has conceded my figure that I've been making no, repeatedly I, I deliberately did that not the UK government has reduced their resource risk deal since 2010-11, and that's the first time Murdo uh, Fraser I, has ever conceded that For point. the avoidance of um, doubt, Commissioner, I did not concede that figure, and the official report will tell us that. I shall read that the official report with great interest now. <laughs> Tom. Thank you. I mean, just very briefly, following on from uh, Patrick Harvey's point and the analogy he, he made between Scottish government and local government and UK government and Scottish government, I just want to confirm that the money that the UK government has withdrawn, for example, through reductions in social security spending, and also specifically around areas to do with the welfare fund, that money is ultimately being found out of Scottish resource money. That's something that's made possible through our income tax policies in Scotland. And if the Scottish government is a Scottish government decision to mitigate that money, which is being withdrawn from the UK government, and that is having obviously um, an impact upon the budget. That's resources having to be committed. Uh, yes, there are, there are areas where we're having to mitigate from our own uh, resources because of reductions in the uh, uh, UK uh, government's uh, spend on these areas. But th th there is an even more mm. sizable figure about the total reduction in welfare spending mm. overall. So there's that which we can mitigate, uh, but the overall pernicious effect of the UK government's welfare policies is absolutely having a profound impact uh, on, on, on individuals and, and, for that matter, the, uh, the economy. But yes, there are various budget lines uh, around uh, welfare and poverty that we are, we are using and supplementing to try and mitigate the damage from Westminster decisions. And to confirm, we do not get the savings that are made by the UK government when, these, when they take these policy decisions? No, we wouldn't make it savings. It's, it's a cost to the Scottish Government, but a necessary investment to support the most vulnerable in society. Thank you. Clarifying. James. Thank you, Convener. Uh, leaving aside the debate about figures and cuts, uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would accept that local councils have been under pressure in recent years and have had to you know, look closely at you know individual de departmental uh, spend uh, and identify um, any reasonable efficiencies. Um, now, I wonder if the what does the Scottish government do in regard to that in terms of looking at their own departmental spend to eradicate any inefficiencies? Um, I mean, to give an example, there was a story in the press at the weekend showing a million pounds had been spent on Scottish government taxes. The figure seemed a bit high to me. So what, how do you run through each of your departments and eliminate any uh, wasteful spend? Convener, uh, the question on general efficiency within Scottish Government is a good one. We, like all parts of the public sector, have to be efficient. And I, I do go through with each portfolio and Cabinet Secretary their uh, budget requests, their efficiencies, their um, uh, savings as well. So I would expect every single part of the public sector to be mindful for value for money, uh, efficiency, and to always try and find those efficiencies, uh, whether it's in uh, procurement or productivity, assets and estate. So we absolutely go through it method um, um, methodically. Uh, we also share the, the experience. We've got the um, uh, Leaders Forum, which brings together all parts of the public sector to share that um, uh, good practice. So yes, I expect efficiency 
uh, to run right through government, not to be the preserve of any one part, uh, and, and, and focus on value for money. Um, and um, you know, th th that's an expectation, and as we go through the budget, something I challenge every portfolio to do. You said it was shared. Are there any published examples of uh, efficiencies that have been identified? Well, we certainly produce information in terms of efficiency savings. Uh, local government does it as well. They provide a, a, a letter every year. I think they still provide that um, a report in terms of the overall efficiency um, that they've um, made. Uh, I can look further at what more we can publish around efficiency savings, but I think there's a lot in the public domain in terms of efficiencies that the government and public sector makes. But again, the totality of uh, expenditures is um, massive, and it is expected to be managed at a local as well as a governmental level. Uh, it's just you said you, you, that some of this was shared, so it would be useful if you could indicate to the committee where, where we could, could go to see uh, examples of this methodology being followed through. So, no, cabinet I think it would also be useful to understand what the scale of reduction in the administration of the Scottish Government has been over the years as compared to local government. I think that would be quite an interesting comparison. We, we do have some information on the website in terms of the efficiency savings, but I'm happy to look at what further information we may have that the committee might find helpful. Angela. Uh, two quick uh, questions, convener, on, on, on local government. Um, given the uncertainty in case around Brexit, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could remind us of the certainty uh, that he has given local government uh, with respect to resource planning assumptions for capital investment and, and, and housing, uh, not just for this year but for uh, future years. And also if he could um, say something you know, share some of his thoughts about how we could uh, improve the uh, fiscal autonomy for local government. Uh, I'm very much in favour of that dialogue, provided increased autonomy is also matched with increased accountability, as we've seen all too often that it's uh, Scottish Government ministers that seem to be held to account uh, for decisions that are taken at a local level. Hey. It's an excellent question in terms of the resource planning assumptions for housing, specifically the commitment for this financial year is substantial, £826 um, million. Pounds. Um, I can provide more information to the committee in terms of the forward years, in terms of that commitment. There's some £3 billion pounds commitment, of course, around um, a housing to achieve that housing target. And we've set out uh, some of those figures to local government on a multi-year basis. So they have that certainty that they can plan and uh, get on uh, with the job. Um, so they have a great deal of certainty around that. Of course, that's all on the premise that the budget is passed, actually, because if the budget is not passed, they don't have that certainty to release that uh, uh, resource uh, to, to build the houses. So I'm happy to share. With, I know Angela Constance is, is well aware of the, uh, the detail of the figures. I'm happy to share that uh, for the committee, because that's not just one budget, but there is the multi-year uh, element of that so that in this area of capital spend we can get on with it and meet that commitment uh, of homes. On the second question around fiscal autonomy of local government, uh, I have said uh, repeatedly I'm uh, open to that, I'm open to uh, engagement uh, on that, uh, but I've asked uh, in that spirit that people bring along uh, a proposition, you know, what is the what is the request and how can it be progressed? So I'm, I'm open-minded on fis more fiscal autonomy um, for um, local government. Right now, uh, we're having the uh, national uh, discussion uh, around transient visitor levy, uh, that element of, um, um, of, of debate. So I think I've shown that I'm open-minded on this. I'm happy to uh, engage if people bring forward constructive suggestions to further empower um, that local decision-making. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that brings us to conclusion. Cabinet Secretary, so I thank you and your officials for giving us evidence this morning on the budget. I now suspend this meeting and I'm going to give it five minutes suspension to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Okay, colleagues, our next piece of business is to consider subordinate legislation relating to the land and building transaction tax. We're joined for this item by Kate Forbes, the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, and James McClellan, who's the head of Fully Devolved Taxes Policy Unit in the Scottish Government. But before we come to the formal consideration of the Minister's motion, we will take evidence on the land and building transaction tax tax rates and tax bans, etc. Scotland Amendment Order 2018. And I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. And I invite Kate Forbes, if she wishes to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener. I'll just say a few words and then very happy to take questions from uh, the committee. So Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Amendment Order provides for changes to LBTT uh, rates and bans as set out in the budget of 12th December. And namely, those are a series of changes to the rates and bans for a uh, specifically non-residential LBTT and an increased rate of the additional dwelling supplement. If I take the two in turn, in terms of non-residential LBTT, these changes uh, ensure two things. First, that Scotland remains a competitive place for those wishing to buy business premises. Two thirds of all non-residential transactions, i.e. those under 350,000, um, will pay less tax or no tax. And all transactions will pay no more tax than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. But it also, of course, raises vital revenue for Scotland. In terms of the additional dwelling supplement, those changes will uh, raise uh, revenue. But equally important, perhaps, they'll also support first-time buyers and home movers, helping them to compete with buy-to-let investors or those buying a second home, which is perhaps a particular challenge in rural areas. And the rate will increase from 3 to 4%. Lastly, in terms of process and timing, those proposals um, are put forward following discussion with Revenue Scotland. And as I understand it, their evidence makes that clear. And in terms of our timing, we sought to balance uh, the clear risk of forestalling if the introduction of the changes were delayed until the 1st of April 19, as per SFC evidence, as, and as I understand, the committee will appreciate. But it also allows Parliament the full 28-day period to scrutinise the legislation, taking recess into account. We have lastly also included transitional provisions so that any transactions concluded prior to the 12th of December will not pay the increased rates. And that, I think, is an important principle of fairness. But I now look forward to the committee's questions. Thank you, Minister. I think we'll start with questions from Murdo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Ministers. Before I go down this route, I just remind members uh, of the uh, entry in my register of interest that relates to uh, my uh, property investments. Um, can I ask about the increase in additional dwelling supplement from 3% to 4%? Um, I quite appreciate from the government's point of view, it's a, it's a revenue uh, raising uh, measure. The committee has had uh, evidence from a number of uh, interested bodies, the Scottish Property Federation, the Scottish Association of Landlords, uh, Arla Property Mark and NAEA uh, Property Mark expressing some concern about the potential impact of this on uh, investment in the uh, private rental sector. And, and they all make a, a similar point that already we are seeing, um, due to not just the additional dwelling supplement, but a number of other legislative changes, both at Westminster and uh, at Holyrood, including changes to taxation. The investment in, in uh, private uh, rented property is less attractive than it was um, to potential landlords. As a result, there is a contraction uh, in the... Uh, the market and, and there, there is a, a knock-on impact, they would argue, uh, which leads to higher rents, so there is a, a social impact from, from, from making the private rental sector less attractive to uh, investors. Um, and I'm wondering, in light of that, what consideration the Scottish Government gave to, to those issues when it uh, uh, decided to, to go for the increase from 3% to 4%. And I also wonder if you could explain to us why the 4% figure was, was arrived at. Was it was it just a figure plucked from the air? Did it seem a reasonable increase? Or was there anything more scientific about reaching that 4% figure? So I think there's three questions in there, and I'll take them each in turn. First on investment, then on rents, and then the um, evidence for the increase in 1%. In terms of ADS, it is worth bearing in mind that there is a policy objective here as well as the uh, ability to raise revenue, and that is to support first-term 
first-time buyers. And I think the important evidence in that regard is given uh, from the SFC, whose analysis showed that any decline, well, the majority of the decline in ADS transactions would be made up of first-time buyers and home movers. In other words, that where there is a loss of ADS-related tra transactions, um, the majority is absorbed by the market when it comes to first uh, time buyers and home movers, which in itself is part of the policy objective of uh, this change. But secondly, in terms of the investment, we do recognise the role that the private rented sector plays. Um, and in the evidence, I think it's fair to say that was provided, tax is seen as just one of a range of financial, regulatory and other considerations. And the Scottish Property Federation was clear in its committee evidence that other changes um, have more significance than uh, the changes to ADS. Um, the re sector remains a steady 15% in Scotland. So whilst perhaps an increase in ADS um, means that some take other decisions, some in the property sector take other decisions, others see new opportunities as well. Most importantly too, when it comes to investment, um, we, we recognise the role that the private rented sector do play and when it comes to creating affordable housing, often people will choose the private rented sector as a form of affordable housing. And that's why there is, um, we have the, the exemption for six properties uh, or more when it comes to ADS in order to get that balance right. Moving on to, to rents, again, it's worth saying, and it's perhaps obvious, that these changes have no bearing on landlords with existing property. It only applies to new purchases. And whilst I obviously can't comment on uh, decisions that individual landlords might take in specific circumstances, tax is again one of a range of other um, concerns. Um, the ONS, Office of National Statistics, shows a 0.5% annual increase in rents to November 2018 across all private tenants in Scotland, and that's compared to an annual increase of 1% uh, in England and 0.9% in Wales. Uh, and that suggests that whilst ADS has been in place, albeit at the 3%, that it hasn't resulted in a significant increase in rents. Lastly, uh, to touch on the point around why 3 to 4 per cent. Um, we were very keen to strike the balance which the question highlights in terms of supporting the private rented sector whilst also uh, achieving this policy objective of, of supporting first-time buyers. Uh, and the, the SFC um, evidence, again, I think makes that clear that we've got the balance just about right because, as I say, the majority of uh, ADS transactions which are lost will be made up of first-time buyers and home movers. But there's an important point there around fair fairness. So in the budget process, we of course looked at different rates and there was a judgment taken that a 1% increase strike a, a balance between supporting the sector but at the same time supporting first-time buyers. Okay, th thank you for that, um, Minister. So, so on, on, that, on that last point you made about the increase, uh, would it be reasonable for the Scottish Government to be monitoring where uh, the impact on the market is in relation to the, to, to the increase? Uh, and and you know, should the evidence show a detrimental impact uh, on the uh, private rental sector? Is this something that might be reviewed in future? Absolutely. Um, that will definitely be kept under review because of the twin aims here of supporting first-time buyers um, as well as uh, revenue. Um, there, it's, it's quite important that we, you know, in discussion with the various representatives that have written to you uh, with evidence, and I appreciate their evidence, it's important that we, A, track the, you know, as I said, the sector continues to be a solid 15%. Uh, we track that, we track uh, rent increases, um, and we also, most importantly perhaps, look at the appetite and the demand from first-time buyers and home movers. And we've, of course, got a range of initiatives to support first-time buyers. This is one of them, but our key concern is to ensure that if you want a home in Scotland, you're able to get an affordable home in Scotland. Okay, thank you. I wonder if I can ask one other question, Camino, on a slightly different subject, but related. Um, in the submission from KPMG, they uh, make the point that <coughs> the um, the period within which you can claim back ADS if you're an inadvertent second-hand second homeowner 
is 18 months in Scotland as opposed to three years elsewhere in the UK. And they ask, uh, given the increase in ADS, is the Scottish Government considering increasing that period from 18 months to three years? Uh, I've certainly had cases in the past with constituents who inadvertently are caught in this situation because they, they can't sell a property and they end up being hit with ADS, which was never the policy intent. Is that something that the Scottish Government will consider? Yeah, and we do recognise that there are some concerns around the application of ADS in specific cases. And as Murdo Fraser will know, because I think he welcomed it at the time, we've of course legislated in the past for a minor change to make it fairer. For those who, ha you know, if there was a, a couple moving in together uh, and um, only one name was on the um, the previous house to, to change. Some of the suggested changes, while sympathetic, are quite significant in scope. And so whilst there's no plans to undertake a review at, at this time, we will shortly be consulting on a new approach to the planning and the management of devolved taxes, well, which will provide a more structured and efficient means of making some of these changes. I am mindful of that particular challenge, 36 months to 18 months, but I would probably argue that it only affects a small minority of cases, because in most situations, um, somebody has been able to sell uh, a property within the 18 months. And in terms of those who have indicated a desire to claim back, um, most do so within the 18 months. It's extremely uh, rare for it to, to prove a challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Very much, um, Minister. You uh, you mentioned fairness as one of the the objectives of uh, of government policy, and we're frequently told that that's a a, a goal of of tax policy generally for the the Scottish government. Uh, I think that the problems with with this don't relate to the the changes that are being proposed today, uh, but actually go back to uh, the conclusions of the the Merley's report in two thousand and. 11, which uh, said that there was no sound case for maintaining what was then stamp duty uh, and recommending that it be abolished. Uh, notwithstanding the changes uh, that are being proposed today, does the government recognise that LBTT remains a tax that a great many people on ordinary incomes and living in uh, typical value homes will pay several times in their lives, but someone like the Duke of Buccleuch will probably never pay? And, you know, Patrick Harvey recognised an important point uh, around fairness. And I think whilst not touching specifically on the changes that we've made today, our efforts in making these changes is to make um, the tax fairer and to make sure that we do two things when it comes to LBTT. We protect those um, who are perhaps on the, the lower um, income levels as much as possible, um, whilst uh, also try with a policy objective with ADS of protecting those who are trying to get on the property ladder for the first time. Um, so whilst no tax is perfect and LBTT is not perfect, and I think looking at you know the one change that we have made so far since the tax was introduced recognises that we are willing to try and make these taxes as fair as possible, um, but recognise there will always be scope for um, doing more. Yeah, I, th I think LBTT was a slight improvement on what went before, and, and these changes are a slight improvement uh, in their own right. Uh, but is the government still open to the wider argument that the tax base needs to include a, a modern approach to asset wealth values, such as land and property, rather than merely transactions? I think certainly in, in terms of the way that the, the Scottish Government has taken on more tax powers over the course of the last two years in particular, we're always looking at ways to make current taxes fairer and to ensure that if there are improvements to be made more generally to the tax take, that we, we consider those as well. But when it comes to this, it's also worth recognising that um, with this SSI going, if it's approved uh, today, that will raise uh, an additional almost £40 million, which will go directly to supporting people uh, who live and work in Scotland and may rely on our public services. Thank you. Willie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, Kate, I'd asked the Fiscal Commission last week, who had forecast fairly, fairly healthy growth in the LBTT revenue over the next five years why they thought that was, and it wasn't entirely attributable to the policy changes. Uh, I mean, they are yielding a, a net revenue gain for us, but the gain in, in LBTT revenue exceeded that. So I just wanted to ask yourself why you think that is. 
I'd asked Derek that just shortly before you, and of course Derek took the entire credit for that, <laughs> been due to policy changes, but there seems to be an additional element here of gain for us in LBTT that isn't quite attributable to the policy change. More than happy for him to take the credit for that <laughs> and not me. Um, but it's true to say that, you know, for all years from 1819 onwards, LBTT is forecast to raise more than is removed from the block grant adjustment. Um, and in terms of a... You know, reduction in, in forecast this year. That is in, you know, the SFC was quite clear that that um, relates to a uh, flatter house prices and transaction growth, which is a common feature across the entire UK housing. So I think that demonstrates that it is a, a tax that it works and is raising a uh, valuable revenue. And of course, in a um, with our own taxes being so contingent on the performance of the rest of the UK, it is a, a vitally important tax. Do you think there's an element of it where property values are moving through the thresholds and therefore uh, yielding as more of a revenue there? I think the Fiscal Commission kind of alluded to that as a potential explanation for, for part of this. Yeah, I, I think I think that the changes have, you know, reflect the slightly more unique aspects of the Scottish property market as well that is, you know, slightly different from, from the rest of the UK. OK, thank you. Nobody else has indicated a desire to ask a question. We therefore move to agenda item three, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I therefore invite the Minister to move S5M15215 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, Tax Rates and Tax Bans, etc., Scotland Amendment Order 2018 be approved. I move. Any members got any other further comments? Yep, yep. Uh, th thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't intend to, to oppose uh, the instrument, but I think it's worth putting on record. Uh, some of the, the issues that have been raised uh, in, the, in the previous evidence session from, from stakeholders about the potential impact on the private rental sector uh, from these uh, tax changes. So I think that you know, the jury is, is still out on the likely impact, and it's something I think we need to be careful to keep a close eye on the market impact of these tax changes. Okay, we can note that in the report, obviously. Uh, but I now put the question... Um, on, on the motion, the question is that motion S5M15215 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. We're not agreed. OK. In which case, there will be a division. <laughs> I miss saying that. Uh, and, um, <laughs> so, all those in favour, please show. All those against, please show. All those abstained, please show. There were eight for and three abstentions. The motion is approved, and the committee will um, now produce a short report on the order. Now, as previously agreed, uh, the, the next we will be taking the next item in private. I thank the minister and officials, and now close the public part of the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>